The unofficial round one of the Rugby World Cup warm-up matches has been completed and in today's video I'm going to be looking into these games and reviewing some player performances, some key stats and key events in the match. Now I'm going to start off with England playing Wales in Cardiff. England losing by 11 points. Now England were favourites going into the match and as an English supporter it was a very very disappointing result. Going into a warm-up match you want to see your team playing some expansive rugby, trying out combinations but this was not actually the tale of the tape. England kicked three penalties throughout the game with Wales kicking two, all of which came in the first half. Neither team were very adventurous. England mainly going one-off rucks um, and then straight into a box kick. Uh, Wales didn't really play out their own half either and also sent box kicks back. So it's a very box kick heavy game and a lot of kicks in play in general. And when England did have possession, they were sort of around the halfway or the opposition 10 metre line and were really just going off one-off runners, maybe a little tip pass, but it never really saw uh, the backs. No England player really stood out. Freddie Stewart had a reasonable game, as usual, very, very secure under the high ball. But in attack, England were very, very poor. They mean the creator chances, but when they ever got into the, the Welsh 22, drop ball after drop ball just killed the English momentum. Now, I believe it's 16 handling errors um, by England in the whole game. Now for a professional outfit, a club team, let alone an international team, that is very, very poor. The attack simply didn't function. Mark, Marcus Smith looked very isolated. He was making some okay breaks, a couple uh, meters made, but he never really linked up with anyone. And the back line really just didn't function with Guy Porter having a relatively poor game. Joe Marchant was okay defensively, but in attack went missing. Combine that with Joe Thocken and Singer on the wing, making some drop balls, some handling errors, getting bundled into touch. It was a really poor English performance. If we look into the stats, England had edge territory, so they were playing in the Welsh uh, half more than Wales were playing in our half, but they never really capitalised on it. England did edge the metres also with some nice breaks, but once again they clearly didn't finish it off with 371 metres to 321 metres of Wales. Now Wales edged the defenders beaten with 21 to 19. A brilliant break from Jack Morgan and the inside ball to Gareth Davies opened the scoring uh, in terms of tries for Wales and then George North went over later in the game. England only made 19, uh, beat 19 defenders, most of which came in the first half. A few good uh, evasive runs from Freddie Stewart from the back. But the key stat is the 16 handling errors from England. Combining that with uh, the high tackle percentage success from Wales really, really made England not be able to get over that line and um, really struggled in attack. So all in all, a very disappointing day from England. And if I had to say anything about the game, it was the attitude that was most disappointing. disappointing. Um, was it 75 minutes on the clock? We need two tries. We're going to box kick. Like I understand it's a warm-up game, but you've really got to try and play some rugby uh, rather than just box kick it, box kick it, box kick it. Now moving on to a more high scoring game, Ireland versus Italy. A game Ireland were 24 points favourites I think for. Uh, very good performance from Ireland with a, with a changed outfit, some key names in there with the likes of Caelan Doris, but Jack Crowley and Craig Casey given the, given the tools at nine and 10 uh, for the game. It's a good performance from Ireland, uh, reasonable first half, good start to the game, uh, bar the three points Italy kicked early on. Ireland looked dominant throughout, never looked like they were going to lose couple scary patches with Italy going over in the corner but all in all it looked like a very comfortable performance from Ireland. Their rolling mall was working really well although Italy really weren't letting up. Italy weren't going to be pushed over in that game with a very strong Italian outfit. The back line for Ireland never really quite clicked. They made a couple breaks but to be honest I expected a little bit more but it was really the immense forward pack of Ireland that, that got them over the line uh, in, in, in emphatic fashion. They never really got away in the game only scoring five tries when they really expected to score a few more than that. But that may be me discrediting Italy a little bit too much. In terms of uh, running meters, Ireland dominated 566 to 285. I had 60% of uh, possession and 65% of territory. So all in all, a very dominant performance on the stats front as well as on the scoreboard. The Irish turnovers was what I thought was really impressive. Caelan Doris getting over that ball immensely. Um, he's really just an incredible player. Caelan Doris made some brilliant busts in attack. 
And he's not the kind of player that you would potentially go, oh, he's just incredible, flashy player. But he just he does the dirty work so well, gets over the ball amazingly, and really carries hard. So very impressive performance from Caelan Doris. There are a couple Irish line-out errors. Um, very impressive performance from Henderson, the captain. But there's a couple errors around sealing off in the line-out, not allowing access, which forfeited them some good attacking positions, which they really want to iron out before going on to tougher opposition. All in all, a very impressive performance from Ireland. Now, moving on to Scotland versus France. One of my favourite games that I watched over the weekend, although not as potentially a uh, big bigger game considering France didn't put out their full-strength team uh, like the likes of New Zealand and Australia did. But all in all, well, I'm not saying New, New Zealand's team was an all-out you know, World Cup final team, but this was really a very, very changed French team. Probably the, the, the more th second or third choice compared to any of these other teams. A game of two halves, France were incredible in the first half, scoring three uh, tries straight off the bat um, with no Scotland interjection of any tries. So three straight tries for France and then Scotland responded with three straight tries of their own in the second half with France not even scoring a point. The game started off really well from France, moving the ball edge to edge with that typical French flair. Scotland really struggling to get off the line and put the French under any, any pressure. So France started the game off really well. Um, Scotland came back into the game in the second half. They really upped their, their, their line speed and defence and moved the ball really well themselves. Now, looking into some stats, in the second half, Scotland had 63% of all possession. That really does uh, indicate how they got so much dominance on the scoreboard. Despite a late red card by Xander Fagerson, uh, which was the, the first time the new law of uh, referral, so the referee decides that the, the, the incident was worth at least a yellow card and it went for an off-field review. So the first time us Northern Hemisphere rugby fans have seen that and I believe it worked really well. Uh, back to the rugby though, the Xander Fagerson card really didn't face Scotland and they went on to win uh, kicking uh, a late penalty to really get themselves away from the French. In terms of defenders beaten, this is what really surprised me. Despite France's really good start to the game, Scotland uh, beat 24 defenders all in all. To France is 10. Uh, these stats are from Ultimate Rugby, just if you wanted to go have a little look and verify. So yeah, very good, very entertaining game to watch with the Murrayfield fans going away happy in the end. Moving on to Argentina versus South Africa. I didn't watch this game live but managed to catch up on some stats and some highlights. From what I gauged, the, 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 there was a real test match feel to this game. No team really getting an upper hand early on in the game. Both teams opting to kick penalties, but from from South Africa's point of view, disappointing off the tee from Manny Libok with only 56% conversion rate. If the Springboks are got to go on in the World Cup, this percentage needs to be improved. Now, Manny Libok, I believe, is a very reliable kicker. So when I saw 56% success rate off the tee, I was quite shocked. Um, if you look at the alternate 10s, uh, Andre Pollard, I don't think you'd ever see him kicking 56% all in all, I believe he's a much more reliable kicker. Um, so yeah, that was a bit disappointing from the South African point of view and would have made the game look a lot more comfortable, especially in that second half where Argentina scored their try and South Africa opted to kick three points uh, instead of going for the jugular. Good line-out defence from both sides in the first half, really limited any try scoring opportunities um, and the physicality was just was huge, big hits going in from both sides. An Argentinian player, I believe, got knocked out. So I hope he's he's all, all well and hopefully that doesn't impact his World Cup selection. The South African gain line carries were 72 to 24. So these are carries in which you actually get over the advantage line and create momentum. So that was probably one of the stats which, which turned the game in South Africans' favour uh, and let them get over the advantage line and use the outside backs and allowed the tries for Mpimpi and Moody later on in the game and uh, really stretched away from the Argentinians. It was a, it was a high scoring opening to the second half um, from, from South Africa, but the game really got a little bit stagnant towards the end. The sort of the first half good defenses coming back in towards the back end of the game with the Argentinians not wanting to, to concede a lot more points and the South Africans trying to hold on to their lead. So all in all, a very compelling game, good watch, and some really good learnings from both Argentina and South Africa going into the World Cup. Now, on to my personal favourite of all the games this weekend, which was New Zealand-Australia. 
New Zealand were predicted to be 20 point favourites going into this game, which considering the, the talent in Australian rugby uh, was a little bit surprising. But when you factor in the form of Australia and the, them being away from home, you can sort of understand that. Now the game didn't have the sort of atmosphere that I expect from a New Zealand home game. One sort of games you see at Eden Park with sold out and fans going berserk. It wasn't one of those games. It was a, uh, I'm not sure the name of the stadium. Someone could maybe leave that in the comments, but it wasn't one of New Zealand's uh, most used stadiums and the atmosphere wasn't quite the same. But nevertheless, New Zealand um, got the win. So that's all the, the fans will be happy with. But it was actually Australia that started off the stronger team scoring two tries in the first half. A brilliant performance from them in the first half with unbelievable line speed, really shutting down the, the time on the, the, the All Black back line. Damian McKenzie didn't really get a lot of the ball in positions he would really have liked it. A lot of, a lot of back football for McKenzie, which isn't the style he's used to playing at the Chiefs and opted to kick quite a lot of ball away. Um, I say he kicked quite a lot of ball away, but he also, I feel, was a little bit guilty of overplaying at times. But I would definitely say it's the Aussie line speed that, that really, really tested New Zealand in the first half. And then in terms of the Australian attack, it was the options uh, that the ball carrier had at the line, the little tip options, and allowed Carter Gordon some time out the back to, to unleash the back line. And when you look at the likes of the Aussie, Aussie backs, they've been performing in the Super Rugby from the Brumbies, and uh, yeah, they are a very dangerous backline outfit if you let them if you let them have the the front football that they desire. Now the second half was a lot better of the second half for New Zealand, with Australia only kicking three points late on in the in the second half. So very dominant second half from New Zealand, and it almost seemed like I was watching different teams. Now the breakdown work of New Zealand I thought was phenomenal in that second half, really getting off the line, and the turnovers that the likes of Sam Whitelock was getting combined with Ali Sarver really being a menace at the breakdown was, was very, very impressive. Now, the line speed of the Aussies in the second half faded, which meant that New Zealand could get more on the front foot, scoring early in that second half. And uh, when I saw Richie Mwanga came on late on in the second half, I knew the All Blacks weren't gonna let this one slide too easy. And he kicked the three points in the 78th or 79th minute to, to edge out the game and uh, yeah, keep the, the New Zealand undefeated through the the championship and now the the sort of the championship plus one game that they've played this weekend in the Bledisloe Cup. Some stats for you, the Australians in the first, not in the first half, but they were predominantly doing this in the first half, was the nine turnovers they managed to get, which is a little bit concerning for New Zealand, uh, considering the, the, the possession is one of the main things in which allows them to get on the front foot and score tries. But uh, the Aussies impressively secured nine turnovers and 161 tackles. Now that is a lot of tackles to be making, especially against the physicality of the All Blacks. Uh, four pack, the likes of Ali Sarver. Very difficult to be making that many tackles. Um, they made, they, they didn't miss an awful lot. I believe it was maybe high teens or low twenties, um, which is, I mean, it's not overly impressive, but when you consider the likes of the players that they're tackling, you can understand why that stat arises. From a New Zealand point of view, 13 offloads, was one of their main stats which enabled them to to rack up their their two sec two second half tries um, which was once again very impressive uh, Stevenson going over in the second half also on an impressive build up which really turned the turned the ties in the all blacks favor um, turned the tide in the all blacks favor which really as soon as he scored you sort of felt that it was inevitable that New Zealand would stretch away now they didn't stretch away as much as you may think they would have um, especially from the bookies' predictions, but New Zealand come away with the win and uh, 27 defenders beaten also. So you look at the likes of the All Blacks uh, back line that I was talking about. Um, Damien McKenzie in the first half, well, who's probably a bit more flashy player than Richie Mwanga, but then Richie Mwanga brought the control in the second half to edge out what, what was in the end a, a close victory for New Zealand. That was all the games that I'm going to be reviewing from this weekend. Um, some really good results at home for Ireland, Scotland um, and New Zealand. And then some very disappointing performances from England. Um, very disappointed me personally from that. I'd say that's the worst I've seen England play um, probably since I've been watching rugby. So a lot to work on for the likes of England. And um, yeah, thank you for watching this video. Let me know what you thought of the, the results from the weekend. Let me know if I'm over exaggerating how bad England's performance was. 
And um, yeah, thank you very much for watching and let me know what you thought in the comments. Thank you.